that, that piece, of, that bit of cornflake packet is just to protect it. I glued that on just to protect the underside. So that it doesn't get scratched? So it doesn't get scratched and I, I, I can use it I, I later to polish mm. it up. It's super soft. Yes, yeah, nice and smooth. And you see these cuts here, they're, they're very deep. Yes. So that would just mean that no ink would get no, through, is that, that right? No, that's right. So you wouldn't get any of these carvings. That, that'd would be, be white. Completely white. Yes. Is it a lover's tiff? What's the talcum powder for? It's all over that one. Yeah, I'm sure you can see it. Right, okay. Well, I, I, I don't bother because I know what I'm going to print. But for anybody else looking at it, stick that on. Cap badge for the artist's rifles. The artist's rifles. Artist's rifles was a Victorian drinking club. Okay. Right. Didn't mean just visual artists. It meant dancers and actors and all that joined the, the artist's rifles because it was a patriotic thing to do. Before the first world war, be 1880 or so, and they all drank in there. A drinking a, group. A drinking group. And you could pay money and get promoted, and you could become a major in the artist's <laughs> rifles. And then the war came along, and they said, Right, you look inside, right? And they the made them all privates. And um, the first few months of the war, the death rate in junior officers was enormous. Mm. And the, they said, Where are we going to get officers? And they said, they're all these artists' rifles, they're all smart guys, they're all intelligent people. So they're all promoted into, into being officers in there. But uh, you can imagine sergeants shouting at dancers and the artists' rifles and all pouncing about and getting at the line and all that jokes about that. Yeah, yeah. But the artists' rifles, there were many famous artists in that, and I've got a print with. Uh, it's called 1914, it's a big bit of barbed wire uh, and uh, it's got the, the cap badge and um, a detail of uh, all, lots of famous artists that were in the artist rifles uh, and uh, there's a, another older print of a, a dead soldier underneath it I joined them all up and made, made a liner cut of the barbed wire mm. and printed it in 1914 because I knew a guy who was in the, the, the Cameronians, Tug Wilson, who was a soldier in the Cameronians Rifle Brigade um, guarding the French border with Belgium and the German troops were coming across. And he was, he was there at the very beginning of the war. Tug was at the Battle Man and he got wounded with shrapnel in his, in his head, changed his life totally. And he was out because he didn't have a seal of helmet. When I saw the programme, I went back and thought about Tokyo you know, and the conversation we would have about that, and it made me write about the, do something about the Battle of the Marlin. They're all personal things, you know. That's why I said today that the pictures tell the story and not me. Mm. What are the tools that you use? Yes, that, that's the tools. Are these the old ones that your dad gave you? Most of them. I never use that one, I don't yeah. like that one. So how do you hold them to... Hold them like that. It should fit in your hand. I used to be able to hold it in my hand. So then you would draw like this? Yes, you'd, you'd cut, you'd have your pork and you'd... You see when you do, when you have an idea, do you draw first? Yes. The wood, is, you saw the wood there, it was, it was that colour, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I painted it red so that you could, 
when you cut it, you expose the white wood underneath mm -hmm. so you can see it. You know what you've cut. Uh, you know where you've cut. Mm -hmm. You can see it. Mm -hmm. you, I, I draw it on top with uh, ink or a felt tip pen. The box is quite interesting. I, I said to my mother, have you got a, a box? I was thinking of a, a cigar box to put them in. And she says, oh, I've got the very thing. And she went away and second of these, she was, she was back with this, this box. <laughs> How but, old is this box? Oh, it, it dates from her wedding, which was in 1926. And it had silver spoons in it, but there was a bird gallery. And the spoons were taken out and they left the box, right? And she kept the box and there in the 1961 or so, uh, I was looking for the box and she just went out and took it, got it in her hand and gave me the box. And that's perfect. it. Yes, perfect. And it uh, had these things yeah. in it. So and are these old tools then? They last very long, no? Oh yes, of course they last. You, you keep sharpening them. You, you, just, you just get it and, and uh, you put oil on there and you hold it up like that and you, you sharpen it. Mm. That's it. What's the name of these guys? Uh, wood engraving tools. Wood engraving tools. That's awesome. With this one it's quite interesting because you had to imagine the scene from outside and you were in there. Yes, yeah, I just experienced it, you know. I didn't have a photograph of all of us sitting there, you know, you just imagine it and, and draw it. Is that the scene of you walking the pram? Yes, around at, at Cleveson Road. In memory as well, or would you have taken a picture of it? Uh, or be memory. Memory. Imagination, yeah. Well, not imagination, but memory, you know. Memory, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's such a beautiful way of storing the memories, you know? Yes. Because the memory is between real and not real. We have memory, which is like based upon reality, but there's elements of it that change. They become surreal in a way, or they like change shape and color and... Of course, because your memory is inaccurate. Mm -hmm. So I feel that the drawings are a bit like a nice metaphor of memory because like they are real life, but the perspective are, are exaggerated. There was a hedge there and a hedge, well you make, it, you make it a hedge, you know, the stones are, I like the stones. And I love the perspective. Like this very extreme perspective. Well, it's it to lull you onto the space. But it gives it a nice... Um, it's, it's composition. Medieval times they wrote by hand in the monasteries. The scriptorium, mm. they, they wrote all in the monasteries. Basically the Germans wanted to print it and they would get a big block of wood and cut out all the letters on the block. Each each page would be a new block and they'd have, have it written down backwards and they'd cut it out and you'd take one print. But um, Gutenberg thought of the idea of sawing up these blocks and taking the individual letters so that they had he didn't invent printing because it had been invented long before that. He invented the movable type. Each letter was a single unit bolted together, tighten it all up and then print it. Change. Change it into another one. Whereas previously they had one piece of wood and they would carve one page out with all the individual letters and he just sawed them all up and got the individual letters. Of course that was revolutionised everything. It made books possible and that, that made the knowledge possible. You could pick up a book and read about that. It was a, a tremendous change in, in uh, learning and knowledge uh, that you could have. Woodcuts were very famous um, and wood engravings uh, developed because you would get getting exotic woods from South America. South American boxwood and they turned it on its edge and you got very hard 
to find lines that you could get with it. Whereas wood wood cuts are uh, different. The the line is bigger, yes. They would go very fine as well, no? Oh yes, they, but they were they were absolute masters of it, you know. I'll get, I guess many tra many generations of a tradition. Oh yes, uh, very old. There's one uh, in the the one in the, the uh, just about there, uh, a big long one of a lady, maybe you know, it's, in it now. it's very worn. That's 1800, Kunisada. They, they tended to copy, because I like Hokusai, I would sometimes change my name to Hokusai and, and say Hokusai 3 or whatever, uh, we'd do that. So there's Kunisada and there's various other Kunisadas, but that, I think that's the original one, about 1800. So what, what would be the artist that for you, you say, that were your major influences? Oh, Hokusai. Oh, yes. Oh, I would see. I like Utamaru. He's a good guy as well. But uh, Japanese prints in general. And other artists, like for example, uh, some other Scottish artists, is there anyone that really influenced you as well? Joe Nerdley. Mm -hmm. uh, and a guy called J.D. Um, Ferguson. I saw him once in there. It was really, really foggy. November fog was thick, and he was standing in the RGN. I, I was exhibiting, and uh, he was there. He was a, a grand old man, you know, and he had a big brown coat, a brown soft hat. He just looked like a big bit of fog that uh, drifted in, you know, he was standing there. So, would the wood engraving be something that was uh, done regularly, like when you were. Oh, still? yes. Yeah? Yes, uh, before photography really got going, it was done. There were, were studios where the, and they do it for the London Illustrated News, was it? They, they would cut them, belt them out, and the guys would earn a living doing that, churning it out. Anyway, I, I, I got that, and, and the box. The box to me is as valuable as a... Your treasure. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, From your mother and your father. Yes, that's right. So when you were given the tools by your dad... Yes. And you were like... I said, what the hell am I to do with them? <laughs> when I uh, went to art school, I had to get a portfolio. You needed at least two hires and three lows to get into art school and your portfolio. The hard thing was the portfolio. In my portfolio, a lot of lino cuts. So I was used to the idea of printing and reversing. When I went to art school, I never did. Uh, although two of my tutors were really good uh, wood engravers, they never ever mentioned it. Never mentioned it. So you never encountered it in no, school? No, no, didn't. So I didn't know anything about it. It's and I, curious that your dad brought it to you, no? Like that's he what came in and said to me, I think you might like this. Perceptive in that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I uh, I got it and I went out and looked for a book on wooden engraving and, and found one. That's how you learned? Yes, I just sat and read the book and, and looked at the pictures and, and it was love at first sight, you know. I was, I was hooked on it, you know. And this one I hate flying. I hate flying. So is that you on the... Uh, well, that, that's me there and I've got a drink. It's a view of them going because a view, I had to tilt the airplane so that I could see them going out of the window. And we're flying into Clyde Bank and it was turning, I, I could look out the window and see them going. I've got a book there about uh, about the uh, Hokusai and um, he, he thought of different ways of showing you Mount Fuji, you know. It's slightly turned, it's not quite horizontal, the aeroplane. Yeah. And yeah, John, really... John Wayne is up on the television screen and the television screen there. Yeah, it's true that the tilt of the airplane, you can tell. Yes. Because of like the circle. 
Yes. It's, it's not even. So That's right. You get this like flying to the right side, you know, almost, no? Turning, no? Yes. I'm going somewhere, is it that, 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 that there? So this is another one of the view of Dumgoin. Yes, only it's taken from um, the end of Royston Road at the Gasworks. Yeah, I find it incredible that you worked around the idea of like the 36 views of Dumgoin. Oh, the Japanese did that. Uh, uh, Hiroshige did one of the 36 views of something else. But so. I like it a lot how you managed to show that view, but with many other things happening. Yes, Hokusai would do the same thing. He would show you something, um, people doing something, and gathering the harvest, planting the rice crop or something like that, and Mount Fuji would do uh, over, over it all, eternal. Well, we all run about like scared rabbits, you know. Mountains, mountains have that that patience. No? Yes, that's right. The the fishermen and the, and the peering through the mist is the, the Mount Fuji up there. So that's also a Hokusai. Yes. But what year did Hokusai draw these things? Uh, about eighteen thirty. He, uh, he retired to an old man who was li living uh, on his investments. He was quite wealthy. But he, his grandson it persuaded him to make investments which actually went down the drain. And he, uh, at 70, Hawkeye found himself uh, penniless again. He had to start work again. And uh, in that period, uh, and he told me he made the 36 views of Mount Fuji, his masterpieces. Very early. It seems that you went more and more intricate, no? Yes, got better at it. You cut it with your right hand, but you move the block with your left hand. You, you, you manoeuvre the block with your left hand and you, you keep your right hand steady. You do move the right hand a wee bit, but the move, main movement comes with the left hand. You turn the block. There you are. That's uh, my granddaughter. I was, I was making a design, you know, with it interrupted by different sizes of square so design. Thing on the bottom is the the dummy. The dummy for the baby. Yes. <laughs> I can imagine you discovered a whole new style of drawing. Yes. Yes. Totally different from uh, from painting, you know, totally different. My later paintings, the ones that I've sold that won't be in the exhibition are, are the good ones I think are, are, I found a way of painting that I liked eventually. I still feel I'd like, like to paint mm. again. I feel art sometimes, the fact of creating, it's very important the action that one does when it creates the oh, art. Oh yes. And the, the action itself makes the style. Yes. And, and it makes us as uh, It's very artist. physical, yes. So I guess like the wood, uh, in different of the painting, it has a completely different gesture. Wood's different. Wood's great to look at. Mm -hmm. It's it's got a magic of its own, you know. It's quite good. I can I can think of one occasion where I, I was cutting a a, a line of a, a, a wee girl holding a kite, and the the whole movement of cutting it in one sweep mm. with your chisel going. Uh, I, I, it's good. Because there's no, there's no erasing, right? It's very, it's very like... You can't glue it back down again, no. It's very instantaneous. It's no, got, it's like got to be right first time, every time. Sometimes you make a mistake and you have to think about how you can work your way around that to incorporate. And sometimes um, 
things come to you that, that appear. I've got a picture uh, and I'm standing holding a wooden horse. I don't know where the wooden horse came from. I, I, it's a toy horse and I'm standing holding a toy horse. I often think that there's some significance that I put this hand holding a toy horse. Why? No mm -hmm. idea. Uh, someday I'll find out why I'm holding it. I'm lying in my deathbed. And it's, oh yeah, I know, I know. Is there a lot of imagination involved in your wood engravings? Uh, oh yes, of course. Like, it's like, but it's also very real, no? So like, where do you draw the inspiration from? I try to make it about real life, you know, like my teeth and mm -hmm. this one. Right, now that, that's the printing press that I worked on in the print studio. It's an old Victorian thing called uh, an eagle press. And that, that's real life, that's the press I walked on. And that's me beside it. And I, I even got my bifocals mm -hmm. and my glasses. The wooden block is done going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a, a print of of uh, the 36 views of I'm going. Yeah. Different views and different things in them. Um, you, you'll see them all at the, at the big expression. Do you ever go out with a wooden block and draw directly no, the wooden no, block? No, 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 no. So how would your process of like from zero to a hundred be? Because you'd see something at some, at some point and you'd think, oh yeah, that's a good idea. And you go and maybe do a thumbnail drawing to work it out in your head and then come in and it made me go out and take a photograph and, and see uh, what, what can I do with that and, and work up that way. Are you a notebook person? Uh, sort of, sort of, but no. I was taught that you should carry your sketchbook around all the time, but um, I never did that. That's an old thing that I couldn't bear throwing out because yeah, yeah. I remember it uh, during the war years coming in it, and it was going paraffin built and it, it created a lot of dampness in the house, you know, Aye. because paraffin. Is it a stove, no? Yes, it's a, a Vala stove. I did a wee print of it. In your prints there's a lot of uh, objects of your life, no? Yes. The object is important. Yes. I photographed the hair of I made up wooden paper sticks. That was the last one I was working on. Is that a newspaper? The newspaper, the Herald. Uh-huh, yeah. Was that going to go with other drawings beside it? To uh, well, that, that's as far as I got with it. I was thinking of, of just that one. I might have written something underneath. Did I make the obituary? <laughs> that's what I was thinking of. <laughs> and work out the size that I need for the, the wood and then get the wood together and prepare it and um, take tracings of it, probably get it reversed in the printers, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. photo printers, or just trace it and, and go around the other way mm -hmm. and, and transfer mm -hmm. it to the block and then start on it. Mm -hmm. As you cut through the red surface, the white surface shows underneath and you can see it. Mm -hmm. Print it. Yeah, how? And uh, there's a, there's a roll of, it's, it's a printer's ink, but I a, a metal plate, and you, you skirt the back ink from this onto the metal plate and roll it up with the roller. Mm -hmm. Get it smooth and you get a, a nice thin even coat on your roller, and you roll it up. I had a, 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 a L-shaped piece of wood that you, right angles are important. You, you put it in, you get it in the same place. So that it doesn't move. So it doesn't move and it's in the same place. And you, you put your paper down there and you rub it with a spoon. And you print it off like that. So uh, you print it with a spoon? Yes. And in this book that you first read, was the technique of the spoon explained there? Or was that something that you did? No, remember I came to it with a tradition of cutting in lino. Yeah. And that's how I did it in lino. And it was only when I went to the print studio that I used the, the press. That bit down is lino, because the block is that that bit. 
and all all this down here is all all of black there is all lino. So you can see the difference in the line. So it's not only one print. Oh no, there's two prints there. Nowadays they're using uh, Canadian maple. It's hardwood and pretty smooth. Mm -hmm. It's not as good as that as boxwood. It's not not as good. It's much tougher. Uh, whereas it's like butter. You know. Yes, that's it. Because the paper is so thin that it gets everything. Oh yes, yes. That's why it's that's special paper for it. Haiku Rin. Is the paper coming from Japan? Yes. So I've been looking around and there's so much Japanese artwork. They were they were good, they were the best. And uh, they, they were woodcuts, they weren't wood and gravy, like lino. Okay. It was, it was, they were just flat and just cut them out. But they were absolute masters of it. And the artists would draw it and hand it to a guy who would cut it and the princes would print it. Uh, and they were experts at it. And they had uh, presses. That I, I've yet to see a, an illustration of a Japanese printing press but they could make minor adjustments to register the colours, get them in the right place. How many prints would you normally do of a Well, latterly I was doing 50. Mm. I made a mistake, I did a, a reprint of, um, called Tea Cake, of a model holding up a big turret's tea cake. You know what? Yeah, yeah. And I only made 20 of them, and they went within couple of days just sold out, you know. But you always could do more, no? I could, I could do more, but it's not the same. It's not, when you say it's second edition, it's... Because that's a whole, that's a whole tradition, no? For print yes. makers. Like, there must be a whole tradition. Yes, but that, that it only when it began to become valuable, the artists wrote that on, on it. What the edition number. Durer's prints etchings were made till the plates ran smooth. I brought What's this in to, to show you. Well, first of all, the raised part would be the size of the block, the, the wood engraving block that I would make. But this is for colour. So you also print with colour? Yes. On the wood. Mm -hmm. You've got to make sure that you've got a right angle because everything goes in there to make sure that they're in the same yeah. bloody place. You've got your paper masking tape down mm -hmm. so the paper won't move. You, you put your black and white block in there, it, you print that, peel that back, and you, you, you've you got this raised up so that it's the same height, and it, it goes in there, and you print it. And what I've got here is a jigsaw print would you have an order of like what colours the first? Oh yes, of course. It's cut so that it looks like a jigsaw because it fits in mm. and is held in the same position. Exactly. Yeah, get it in the right angle. Yes. And do one colour at a time. Yes, you do one colour at a time. And you, you have the, the it's already, you've got a sheet which has the black and white print on it and then you ink up the other one and fit them together mm. and slip it in and it's got to get into the, the right angle in there and then you put the paper down and print it. The, there's a big print called um, rent a bike and I was very pleased with that because the registration is absolutely perfect. Every bloody time, it was great, a great feeling that I got the registration absolutely right. Great. What's the story of that painting? Oh, it's yeah. a painting called Memories of Joan Eardley, okay. of Joan E, right? And uh, it's a scene of McCausland Street, and it, it's looking at uh, her studio, and uh, she's walking down the street with her big shoulders and her portfolio and her jacket and her collar turned up, and uh, that's in the background, and the street is... Well, it was a beautifully smooth macadam street and the, the kids used to play uh, roller skate hockey on it with, <laughs> up with walking sticks uh, in there and uh, I used to go up there to school because my school was up, up at St Mungo's Academy. In the foreground 
are the, the two Samson kids, or, or Joe and the other kids that she painted par parodies of them uh, with the wee squinty eyes. And it was me in my short trousers. My oh, mother made me wear shorts until I was ancient, you know, and I think <laughs> long skinny legs with knees, you know. And that, that's about that period of my life going past. And every morning I used to see her going to the, our studio. In your painting you have the painter and the kids that she would paint. Yes. That's lovely. Yes. The, and the street where and you the would street. see them. Yes, where I would see them. And in the foreground there's imaginary posters for the cinemas. Mm. It was a great place because you in the in the, the age of the town and, and the the Savoy and La Scala and the Gold were along this, just along the street and in that direction it was Grafton the cinema and the casino and the Carlton all oh, cinemas it was cinema so Glasgow was cinema city. I was brought up in the in the forties the when there was only the cinema as entered there, no television and you went to the cinema so I was brought up in all the the classic black and white movies. Do you think that cinema inspired your way of like telling stories through drawing? Because your drawings are very they're very story like storytelling like yes. because you have all of these vignettes. Yes. Because you don't think of one thing. You look at you and, and your mind's remembering other things, you know. When you put them together, you don't see just one thing. You look out there and your mind is going all the time remembering different things. So you want to show these connections through the drawing? Yes, you know, when you, yes, when you yes. Artists should shut up and let their drawings tell the story. Thank you all for coming. I do hope you enjoyed the exhibition. Thank you.